the plane. Yeah. We talked about symmetry and um, bilateral radial symmetry. The sponges, spinal periphera, are the only group of animals that don't really have any kind of symmetry. Okay? They're asymmetrical. How do they grow? They grow wherever there's space. They grow over here. So there's a little space to occupy. Right? Most animals are really constrained. Think about trees. They can grow sort of um, however it's convenient and wherever there's sunlight. Right? Animals can't do that. Right? Animals are symmetrical normally, except for sponges. Sponges are very unique. Right? The phylomedaria are the radially symmetrical animals. Oh, this is just more about this. Phylomedaria. Okay, this includes things like hydras. These are freshwater um, organisms that certainly occur right here on campus. Um, the jellyfish is the coral. There's things like man of war, anemones. About 11,000 species. Um, I think we said in the sponges there were maybe five or eight thousand species. Okay. How many species of animals are there? Just for context. Again, I'm not really interested in you guys memorizing a whole bunch of stuff that you're going to forget, like the like the number eleven thousand. But I'd like for you to have some kind of general perspective. Is this a lot? Eleven thousand? Is that a lot of species? How many animals are there total? Described? I think it was either 8 million or 8 billion. Yeah, that's right. When you, in, you're getting even into the ones that estimated there's probably like 8 million. Mm -hmm. Currently described about 1 million. Okay. So 11,000 out of a million is not really that many. Okay. Um, there's probably almost this many beetles in Georgia species. All right. But it's more than sponges. They're old, another ancient group. Where do we find them? Mostly in the ocean. Okay. Sponges, same thing. We can see these patterns. The old groups are mainly marine. Yeah. What's the 700 or more phase difference? Okay, so this means they arose, the group is about 700 million years old. So MI a million years ago is when it first appeared. Okay. Which obviously the thing is it, this is approximate. Why? Because jellyfish don't really fossilize very well. You know, we're sort of it's a guess. But we have evidence that they're certainly a whole lot older than all the vertebrates. Right? The Darwins have been around a long time. Uh, FW jellyfishes, freshwater. Yeah, we do have freshwater. You guys want to see a freshwater jellyfish? Mm -hmm. They live here in Cherokee County. They're so called oh, shrubs. Yeah, they're so cute. Um, so, yeah, we have hydras and these little freshwater jellies, but mostly this phylum is found in the ocean. They have tissue. Remember, that's a jump up from the sponges. And they have even some rudimentary organs. Cells aggregate into tissues, tissues aggregate into organs, organs work together in systems. systems, right? And then organisms and so on and so forth. Life is hierarchical like this. So we have definitely well developed organs, systems. These guys are sort of down at that low end of animals. They have tissue, rudimentary organs, no organ systems. They are truly symmetrical. Um, why is this adaptive to be, I call it the pizza pie symmetry? Why is that a good, or what type of lifestyle does that suit well to be regularly symmetrical? If you're attached or you're free floating, as opposed to animals that move directionally, right? We're bilaterally symmetrical, right? But we move. And most most animals are bilaterally symmetrical, and that they move, and all of they they have that cephalization. Their head concentrates their sensory organs. Right, but if you are attached, where's your food coming from? Behind you, in front of you, inside of you. Right, if you're floating around, 
It's on the winds of the ocean current. Which direction are you going? You respond in all directions equally. Okay? If you are regularly smart. Okay, so again, try to think about like why why would uh, this be adapted? Why is that a good design? Compare that to bilateral symmetry or sponges that have no symmetry. That's an anemone, right? Yeah, that's some type of anemone, probably. Although, Carl, someone's, well, you probably know more. You said your dad makes. He does fish things. Aquarium and stuff. I think it's a lot of pocket. Yeah, cool. Very cool. Um, two, this is a little bit about development of animals. Um, we have three true germ layers. Um, the Nadarians have two, the ecto and the endo, the epi or the gastro. So they have, during development, one part of, one population of cells becomes the outer layer and another totally separate layer of cells becomes the lining of this gastro vascular cavity. <clears throat> and, um, Depending on which Nadarian we're talking about, many of them have this layer called the mesoglia. Okay. That's between the epi and the gastrodermis. Um, and oftentimes, if it's acellular, what does that tell you? If it's acellular, what's that another way of saying a lot? So then here it says, so the, here's this group, this layer that we find sometimes it's thick, sometimes it's thin. And it, it, this is a really important aspect. It produce of it. food from the mind, right? It's not a cell. Right, it's not cellular, so it's not living. Can um, jellyfish like, create food from sunlight? Can they, what's that? Create food from sunlight. Some can, yeah. They have, will have probably um, some type of photosynthetic algae, maybe living in their mesoglium. Right. And corals do too, by the way. So the mesoglia is a lot of times it's a non cellular gelatinous. It's probably made up of some kind of protein that absorbs water. Um, and then they've got the tentacles, is a common um, characteristic of the nadarians. And then the gastrovascular cavity. Okay. This is that we call it an incomplete digestive system. They have one opening that they eat and they poo from the same. They ingest and excrete from the single opening. Okay. <clears throat> Very different than most animals to have a complete digestive system. There's a eat over here, excrete over there, and separate. But here we have in and out of the same balloon. The gastro, and think about gastro is like the stomach. That's the cavity. Okay, so that's a general body plan of the Nadarians. <clears throat> okay, um, body form, body types, the two main ones are polyps and Medusa. Okay. You see this being a little uh, short essay question, compare and contrast Medusa. You guys will start to see patterns, like when you're looking through the notes and say like, oh, okay, I'm gonna expect something like that on, on the exam. I know the first exam, it's always like, oh, I didn't see that coming, right? But, so the polyp is sessile. The Medusa is planktonic. Right. What is sessile? Anybody have any sessile um, roommates? Non-living? Yeah, sloths <laughs> attached to the couch. Right. Um, planktonic or free swimming. What does planktonic mean? If you're planktonic, you're they not used sessile. By, they use vibrations to move. Say it again. They use vibrations to move. Um, yeah, they, they don't move on their own accord. They use like ocean currents, yeah. maybe. Um, 
And so they're basically just go with the flow kind of animals. Right? But either way, they're not uh, non moving. The polyp is attached um, to some kind of substrate with this thing called a basal disc. Um, the medusa, again, is free floating. The polyp has a thin mesoglea. The medusa has a thick, 80% of the mass of a given uh, medusa is made up of that mesoglea, which is probably just mostly water. A polyp is just the only coral. Corals, yeah. anemones, it's just a baby hydras. Right. The polyp is just a baby girl. It depends. Um, corals never have a medusa. Yeah. But there are some animals. The Darians that have both in their life cycle. Like the Ophelia. Polyps, mostly asexual reproduction. Medusa, mostly sexual reproduction. Now, these are all, right, patterns, trends, but that's of interest. It's worth um, learning those trends. Okay? And some of the tentacles on the polyp are stingers. And, and on the Medusa. Yeah, really? yeah they have these nidocytes. Here's a polyp. You see attached, sessile, thin mesoglea, medusa. It's basically you take this, flip it over, uh, and it's planktonic. They both have a single opening and the um, area for digestion and excretion. Um, they all have tentacles. Um, so a lot of similarity, but asexual, sexual, sessile, planktonic, thin mesoglea, thick mesoglea. I need to be of the um... It's some type of polyp. It's very DNA polyp or something like that. It's like a big rock that's pink and it has about oh. hundreds of polyps on it. Oh, really? And when you touch it, the physical closes up and it shrinks. Is that an anemone? Yeah. It's yeah. Type, so it doesn't sting. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just like you put your hand on it and you grab on your hand and suction cup to it. Oh, it's probably those, it's, it, the, those stinging cells have. Attach, or right, they're not pumping venom that it, it's harmful. It's just they just maybe superficially it's stuck on. Yeah. A lot of jellyfish, if you run it across your hand, it feels like it's sticking on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. They have been able to shrink when it's not happy. It will okay. turn like dark brown. Huh. When it's happy, all the polyps come out and turn bright, colorful pink. That's cool. Some yeah. of the 11,000 species of diversity. Um, so, Sponges, we had basically three main cell types, right? Sponges are over here, very simple, primitive. Uh, humans probably have, I don't know, hundreds of cell types, maybe thousands. Jellyfish is somewhere in between, five main cell types, right? Um, these guys cover and contract. These guys produce the gamete. These guys secrete mucus. Um, nerve cells are about, again, these are all specialized for some specific job. Think about all the things that an animal has to do. Cells become really specialized for doing those really efficiently, but they have to work together. Again, think about sponges. The, each of their cells is like a jack of all trades. That's why you can put them in a blender and they'll come back together. Right? Um, nerve cells are a really specialized in um, sending impulses. And um, in the Nadarians, um, there's no brain, there's no centralization of the nervous system. They have this diffuse net of nerve cells um, that allows them to sense their environment. And then the fifth one here is really specialized for Nadarians, which are these things called midocytes. Okay, they're on tentacles, they have a little trigger. And they have these little venomous cysts that can pump venom and toxin um, into the, their victim. Right? But at the end of the day, it's just a type of cell. It's a specialized cell type. And I'll find it in other groups of, of animals and find them on the tentacle. <clears throat> I'll show you. You can actually see them. Check out that video I posted on Canvas. If you go to high magnification, you can see the individual little metasites on the tentacles there. 
really cool. I know that um, probably don't have every word written down on here, but um, keep going. I mean, should I go slow and write down all the words? I feel like we're going to lose our momentum. <clears throat> So here's a, this would be like a hydra, freshwater polyp. Um, here's the tentacles. You can zoom in on a given tentacle. And in the epidermal cells, here's that nidocyte. Okay, here's the nidocyte. It, and there's nucleus, right? Proof to you that it is a cell. And inside of here, we have this um, apparatus that's basically powered by osmotic pressure. When the trigger is hit, this little trigger here, then the osmotic balance pushes out this nematocyst that has these barbs. That those barbs are what, what makes it feel like sticky, Alex, right? It's not so much suction cups as these little things here. And they'll continue to pump um, that toxins into some of them can be really quite toxic and a lot of times just slide up pain. Right? Um, most of us have gone to the beach and been terrified by jellyfish, right? It's that thing right there. So how do they obtain nutrients? Right? Um, some people consider the darians to be filter feeders. <coughs> They're basically the tentacles, often dangling down if you're a medusa, or tentacles hanging down. Animals go through there. Microorganisms are fish, right? Um, those nematocysts will uh, disable their prey and then they just draw up the um, prey on the tentacle and stuff it into their into their mouth right? their gastrovascular cave again kind of loosely called a mouth because it's also the anus so I don't know it just depends on I guess it depends on the hour whether it's a mouth or the anus well I, I like mouth anus myself um, digestion, largely extra cellular in the gastrovascular cavity. So what does this mean? Digestion, largely extra cellular. How does extra cellular digestion work? Or well, cells breaking it down, what requires extreme amounts of energy? Mm, no, not, not necessarily. So what is what is the extra cellular part? It's not like a, I think it's ec not extra in the context you're thinking of. There's intracellular and extracellular. So we're going outside the cells? One more time. Outside the cell? Outside the cell. These masks, guys. Like, is that what you, can, can you hear me? Is that all you hear back there? Read this. Okay. I'm yelling here. So yes, you excrete the, so there's specialized cells that make enzymes. The enzymes go out into the cavity, and the, the enzymes break down the large macromolecules and cleave it into small micromolecules. Sponges actually take the big particle and bring it into the cell and digest it inside of the cell. Right? That's the only time you're going to see that is in sponges and a little bit in the nidarians. Some phagocytosis happens um, leading to intracellular digestion, but largely and from here and everywhere, the rest of the animals we talk about are largely extracellular. Okay, You eat, you break it down, what you can't digest is again, this is just awkward. Waste expelled out the mouth. This is, weird. this is where our language fails us. Yeah. Out the mouth. So. You can just say throw the. Huh? You, say, you can just say throw the. Yeah. So throw the is in the moment. Yeah. Bad. Bad. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, life cycle of the Nadarians. Um, as we said, there are some that uh, 
some animals that are polyps their whole life. There are some that are Medusa their whole life, and then there are these that alternate between Medusa and Apollo. Okay. Um, and then the sexual Medusa, uh, finding the Medusa they love very much, right? The gametes combine, the zygote develops into this little larvae. The larvae decides it's time to settle down, finds a little spot, makes a new polyp. So on and so forth. Yeah. Let me see if this video works. Not a shitty. This is the written version of this. Okay. <clears throat> you can start wherever you want to. Um, I'll start here with the zygo. Okay. Mitosis happens, goes from one to four, keeps growing to this thing called the blastula, which develops into this larvae, larval stage, which is, bi is bilaterally symmetrical. It's planktonic. And it, or it's actually free spreading. It finds a spot, settles down, it grows into a polyp, which is sessile attached to the substrate. Um, <coughs> asexual budding, so what that means is. All of these are basically like a little piece of this falls off and grows into a new individual core. Okay, no gametes, no exchange of sperm and egg. It's just individual parts of this individual. Well, that's redundant, but parts of this individual break off and make a new core. Is the Medusa hermaphroditic, or is there like? It depends. A lot of times they, they are um, are dioecious or they are sexes separate. Okay. So you'll have male and female. Right. So so basically the asexual part of the reproduction happens here where we multiply that number of individuals, but they're all clones of each other. Okay. These guys grow up. This is what you're seeing in in lab, right? Are these reproductive polyps here? They can bud off Medusa, right? So the polyp makes the Medusa. Is that sexual reproduction? No. Why not? I, what's the sort of criterion for? Well, if you're doing an example, it's like seed. From it's like a seed. Yeah. Well, although the seed is a product of sexual reproduction. Oh. So I like the analogy in that it's like you can take this and it makes a new individual. Kind of a polyp is a, I mean, you have sexual reproduction to make a polyp. Okay. The only time sexual reproduction happens is up here. Why? Because we have an ovary and a testis involved. We have a sperm and an egg involved. We're making a new individual, which is here, by exchanging gametes. Back here, no gametes exchange. Right? So these obelia are bragging about how much sex they're having. It's just, it's not true. Right? It's just making new little Medusa. It's just, it just comes out of there. Uh, that's horrifying. Just walking down the street and you just have a baby. Uh, um, um, so this production of the Medusa is asexual. These polyps were produced asexually here. But these Medusa, as they grow and mature, so is it like pollen? Maybe? This part would be like the pollen. Then I was like, they break see, off. that's the thing. There really is no good analogy in that. Because I was like, they break off, and maybe they come in contact with each other when they break off, and that for like, like pollen. You go take pollen from one plant, he takes it to another plant, right, and it fertilizes the seed. So that that, but in the analogy here, this would be the female part of the flower. That would be the male part of the flower, and then the pollen and the egg come together. This, there's really no analogy. So you're basically producing individual, new individual organisms asexually. I don't know how it works. I, yeah, it's very unique though. And then once these mature, then they can start the life cycle again. So sexual reproduction, asexual reproduction, asexual reproduction. Right? But in both cases, that's happening in the pulp. Okay. In the polyp. 
Credit Kingdom, Animalia, Phylum, Medaria, Class. You should know these four classes. Anthozoan, Schizozoan, Cubozoan, Hydrozoan. Let me go through these briefly and sort of introduce each of, each of these classes. Antho means um, some flower, I think. And this kind of helps me to remember it because these guys are sort of like, like flowers in a way. They are basically all polyp stage. Um, the corals and anemones, they are all marine. And they have this very highly muscularized gastrovascular cavity. Okay, so you'll see there are some specimens up on the benches in the lab. Those anemones are very muscular, the middle part. They don't have a lot of mesoglea. They're thicker, but that thick is muscular, not mesoglea. Yeah, Alex. Did you know that uh, some corals can actually live outside of water? Oh, no, for, for a while? You can take it out, leave it out, it'll dry out, but then once you put it back in water, it will regrow. Huh, they can desiccate and then come back to water? Yeah. I have no idea. I don't really know very well about that. Not all can do that, but like, I guess those are, the coral, they can do that. Those are probably the ones that do well in a, a tank setting. Just, yeah, yeah, so right. like, you can take them out, move them, you can leave them for a month. Uh, as long as they have some humidity, okay, fine. Huh. Yeah, that's wild. So, it's great. You'll see a lot of colorful corals and anemones. That color comes from these algae called zooxanthellae. Okay. So, an algae, is this an animal, a plant, a fungus? What is this thing? It's, 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 it's actually a protist. They're in this weird other group, like the junk drawer of life. You know what they They are photosynthetic, um, and w we're going to talk a little bit about bleaching, um, but that is related to these um, algae. Um, corals secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton, and that's basically what a coral leaf is. As that individual polyp grows, it secretes a little case around itself, right? And that over a period of millions of, tens of millions of years, many, many, many polyps secreting a little bit of calcium carbonate adds up to these giant um, habitats, right? That are found lots and lots of animals. Coral reefs cover a small portion of the ocean surface but yet they support a large portion of, of life in the ocean. They're disproportionately important to the oceans. Um, you, you'll only find corals growing in certain places. Some of these different <coughs> anthozoans here. So again, what are the yellow things? Tentacles. Those are the tentacles. Here's the mouth anus, is that gastrovascular cavity down in the bottom here. These are some type of colonial coral. Yeah, the mouth part is dead coral. Well, this is dead coral, so I guess there would be a calcium carbonate skeleton underneath here, with some type of tissue over top. Um, now, I gather that some of these anemones can actually move around a little bit. They're attached. But this basal disc and move around a little bit. See these giant structures formed over millions of years. Okay, coral bleaching. Yeah. Um, and let's see. Yeah, it's just a lot of the coral dying. Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, didn't they also make a movie about them? What they do is they break off oh, all the coral reefs. The coral acquires food from the algae. Brown coloration of healthy coral is due to microscopic algae called zooxanthellae that live within its tissue. The coral has a special relationship with these algae called a symbiotic relationship. The coral acquires food from the algae and the algae receive a safe place to live. 
However, if water temperatures rise, corals become stressed and this relationship begins to break down. The zooxanthellae begin to leave the coral tissue. Without its resident zooxanthellae, the polyp tissue is transparent and the white limestone skeleton beneath becomes visible. This process is called bleaching. The coral polyps, now a ghostly white, are still alive. If normal temperatures return in time, they can recover their symbiotic algae and return to health. However, if the water remains too warm for too long, the polyps will starve and eventually die. Within a few days, the dead coral skeleton becomes coated in plants that move in to fill the space. Other reef creatures that have zooxanthellae in their tissue, such as giant clams and anemones, are also known to bleach under these stressful conditions. If stressful conditions, such as high water temperatures, occur over large areas, the reef may experience a mass bleaching event. The yeah, so basically, the coral actually ejects that little algae. Or I don't know if it's forcefully ejecting it or the algae decides to leave. Um, but that's what gives it the black color, right? So algae um, when it's warm, it's free moving. It wants to be moving. Okay. So, like, and it escapes. It's weird though. How does it get like it's in the tissue? Yes, it is. Uh, Somehow it leaves through the tissue. It, it hides in the anemone for shelter from the cold. When it gets warm, it doesn't need shelter anymore. Okay. Okay. So the places that you see algae or corals grow, that has to be um, because of that photosynthetic part. And a large portion of its food budget comes from that algae. So they, they cannot live, they don't get any <coughs> carbon energy without the photosynthetic partner. And so they can't live in deep ocean, they have to live in shallow places where there are an awful lot of sediment. So that's why you, um, when you think of corals, you think of crystal clear, and that's not a mistake, uh, no, let's see. Um, class skip as well. um, this is largely the big jellyfishes, um, mostly um, the medusa form, up to two meters in diameter, um, habitat mostly in uh, open ocean up to uh, 3,000 meters. Um, let's see. And then we're, we'll see that rink now in the lab. But basically, the gastrovascular cavity does the digestion. The nutrients probably disperse through these radial canals and um, go to the individual cells there. The jellyfish is mostly on this group. Things on, it's very unique. The box jellies, um, they are tropical, they're smallish, there's relatively few species. So, out of 11,000 species of Nadarians, there's only about 20 in this class. But they're really special. Um, they have um, they basically can actually uh, see and um, chase down their prey. So they're much more active relative to the other darlings that we talked about, this sort of planktonic. Um, and they're very toxic. Uh, Nidocytes have very dangerous um, venom. Very specialized group of, of Nidarians here, class Kiko. There's the little um, sensory cells, just the new size packed in. And then class hydrozoa, uh, very diverse group here. Uh, everything from smaller than a millimeter to more than a meter. Um, some are polyps, some are medusa, some are bull. Um, so lots of variability in this class here. Um, they reproduce both sexually and asexually. 
And the group we find are freshwater jellies, hydras. Um, I think Ophelia is probably in this, the colonial jellyfish in this group. It's a freshwater hydra. These are tiny little organisms. Um, and they're attached to little sticks and the aquatic vegetation. There's their gastrovascular cavity, long tentacles with the nymph sites on them. And there's a freshwater jellyfish. There's the mandible, Portuguese mandible is in this group too. This is the colonial Nidarian. This is not an individual organism. This is a collection of thousands of organisms living together on this big flow. I don't know how that works, but. Um, Why does Columbia look like? Because you mentioned there's some freshwater jellyfish here. What did they look like here? Just like this. Oh. Yep. They're called um, Crespita Custa Sauvia. They're exotic, so i.e. they were introduced from Asia. They don't seem to really do any harm. They're about the size of like a, a quarter or smaller, and they're not dangerous. They don't sting or anything. Um, and they are very strange in that there will be a bloom of them, and then you go. I've chased them for years, and I've never, I still never have seen one. But there are places in Alaska where people have told me they've seen them, and then a day later I go and there's none there. I, I'm sure that they do probably occur in our, our lake out here, but I've never seen them. I, you have to go down every day probably to check them. Um, they've been seen in Lake Altoona. Um, and a lot of other places, but look real small, 1.5 centimeters. They're probably just, you know, filtering out tiny plankton and things from the lakes. Cute, really cute little guys. And then we do have. Um, how many species of jellyfish are there, and how many are toxic? How many of the jellyfish? Yeah, are toxic. I'm not sure. I think that um, it's just spotty. Uh, those Portuguese manivores, I gather, can be kind of dangerous. And then that class Q is out. But I'm definitely not an expert on the darkens. Definitely not. I just love to find these things on campus. Um, we may try to look for these at the bioways. Um, polyps. Right, attached to some type of substrate. Um, a lot of them have symbiotic. This is a really common uh, story in, in the zoology as the green algae living inside the tissue of an animal. The animal gets the leftover sugars, the algae gets a place to live. It works out really well. Everybody gets something. Right? Um, and that's, I think that's it. Those hydras. <laughs> What's the oldest group of Nadarians, according to um, which of those classes would be the oldest class of Nadarian? <laughs> Yeah, this hydrozoans. And again, we saw all the diversity in that group. We've got these hydrozoans and those hydrozoans. So this class is not a good class. It's not monophyletic. I, we got it's split into these two main branches here. Um, and then we get the skipla and the cubozoans here. So it looks like cubozoans are just an off branch here. And then the anthozoans down here. I'm not going to hold you responsible for this level of clay brown, right? But this is just the FII. So you can see how they all fit together. And you can break this down further and further and further. But, um, so that's the classes, uh, four classes in the plant following the diary. Um, all right, well, I want to can this lecture, upload it. Um, I'll see some of you guys in lab. I'm sorry. I have one more slide. I don't know. Oh, is there one more?
Yes, this one. We'll, um, we'll pick up on this next week. So this, okay. So as I said, this level of detail, I, I'm not going to hold you responsible for. It. But what we're going to be doing, we're going to be building this phylogeny out. This is the phylogeny of animals that you guys will um, be responsible to place the individual file and know what are the characteristics that separate these different phyla. Okay, so so far we've just talked about two phyla, spot peripheral. We said that's the oldest phyla. Then we're talking about Fondridaria, and we're just going to keep marching up. That's basically the rest of the class is talking about what are at the end of these, why are these in the group here, why is this a group itself, piecing this apart. Okay. I'll make a copy, a big copy of this, so you guys can have each time a new, new file, you can add it to our big tree and you know mark why it is that they are different from each other. Okay. All right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.